Welcome to the podcast. I'm Dr. Lori Marvis, and today I'd like to welcome Dr. Columbus Batiste, a good friend of mine. How are you? I'm well. I'm well. How are you? Good. It's always good to see you. And, you know, I, I've been meaning to get you on the podcast for some time, so I so appreciate your time. Hey, better late than never. I'm always happy to kind of join and talk with you. <laughs> Excellent. So before we, you know, jump into all that you do and saving lives and as a cardiologist, can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you even wanted to, you know, become a doctor? Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, it's, well, you know, it's probably similar to a lot of folks out there. I am the youngest of fifth, uh, uh, five kids. I was what they call the pleasant surprise, uh, <laughs> as it so happened. My brother is 16 years older than I am. And uh, my sister, oldest sister, is 13 years older than I am. So I was definitely uh, well-loved, to say the least. <laughs> so, you know, I had, I had a lot to live up to. My folks kind of really stressed the whole idea of education and kind of really worked hard to kind of put us through that, that educational system, private school and the variables like that. And my dad kind of just said three options. Are you going to be a doctor, a lawyer, or a business person? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, I guess a doctor, you know? <laughs> and so, but I started kind of looking through books and I was always curious. And, uh, and that's where the love was really born, kind of out of that. I didn't have that genetic code of M to D in my mm-hmm. DNA code. I didn't uh, know a lot of doctors growing up. I grew up in Compton, which mm-hmm. is in South Central Los Angeles. And so we didn't know a lot of physicians, but it was something I always aspired to. That's awesome. So your dad sounds, so my husband's Filipino and it sounds like an Asian culture is like, you can be a doctor, an engineer, <laughs> hard business person. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and he, he went the engineering route. So. <laughs> uh, no, absolutely. And, and, and I have two nieces who are lawyers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's fantastic. That's so funny. Yes. Oh goodness. All right. So you decided to go off to medical school and obviously that went well. What made you choose cardiology? Well, you know, I wanted to actually be the Lakers team doctor, kind of starting out, of course. I, I wanted to be orthopedic surgeon, be the Lakers team doctor with Magic and Worthy and all those guys. And my second year of, medic, of college, I actually did a rotation of kind of an enrichment and learning more about the whole medical school process. And I remember observing uh, a cardiologist on the rotation. I was just so intrigued. And the heart always came easily to me from a physiology mm-hmm. standpoint. It just made sense. It clicked. You know, yeah. it was like an immediate love attraction between myself and the heart. And so <laughs> it was my second year of college. That I actually changed courses, so to speak. And I said at that point, I wanted to be an interventional cardiologist. I wanted to be chief of cardiology is what I said and, and held true to that at that moment on. That's amazing. So you're, the heart called to you. It did. It, it spoke. We, we had this love language and just went right back and forth. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it's true. The physiology of the heart, people either love it or they hate it. So <laughs> yeah. I, I think that's phenomenal. So then now your tagline is, you know, the heart healthy doc. And so how did you find this plant based diet? So kind of just tell us that journey and transition. Sure. Yeah. You know, I mean, it started off in all honesty where I had a lot of patients ask me, hey, doc, you know, what should I do now? I've had my heart attack. What should I do? What should I eat? And like everyone else, I just, I kind of just threw out stuff. Oh, you know, just be moderate. Oh, just be temperate. Oh, no one does is perfect all the time. I said, you know, five sevenths rule, three out of five rule, you know, just the majority of the days. I'd say little quips like that. And I started trying to do a little bit of reading um, as it pertains to things, but I was really unclear on what, on, on the approach. And I'll be honest, things kind of came to a head really around that same time my dad got progressively sick. I mean, he basically, my whole life, he lived with diabetes. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget that one one year I remember kind of approaching, and I would tell him things like, hey dad, you know, did you get your your pills uh, refilled? Did you you get your, your, going for your blood work done? Did you refill your meds? Are you taking it? Okay, great, good job, good job. And he had extensive uh, effects of diabetes. And I remember buying him these braces to fit in his shoes. And I thought like, oh man, I'm such a good son. You know, I went and I brought him, he loved to get dressed up, bought him these fancy uh, dress shoes and had the braces in, in the shoes. And I remember he was walking on the shoes and of course could not sense his feet and ended up developing a wound on this mm. bottom of his foot, you know, from the shoes I bought. 
And I remember at that point, that was basically the beginning of the end. And he ended up never walking again and passing away within about a year and a half or two years. And I remember just completely being traumatized as at that point, certified in internal medicine, certified in cardiology, certified in interventional cardiology. And I remember just devastated over the fact that my dad had passed away. And there was nothing that I had recommended to intervene. And, you know, in, in my world, I get folks saying to me all the time, hey, doc, thanks for saving my life. You saved my life. You saved my life. And it was like, it was, it was crazy. It was like all those words haunted me, mm. you know, because it was just like, okay, whenever someone said, hey, yeah, I really appreciate you saving my life. It was really like a dagger to my soul, really, in terms of that, as it reflected with my dad. And at a certain point, once I kind of came out the haze and the, and the fog, it was just like, you know, I don't want his life to be, to mean nothing. And where at that point I felt like I failed him, where, how did the, the healthcare field, how did the medical profession fail this man who worked hard, you know, who, who was educated, who held multiple jobs to send us to private school. I remember kind of thinking back of him, even a small business of painting curbs, just mm -hmm. to kind of get extra money. So in that way in med school, I wouldn't have to worry about things, right? And him making a statement of, well, I don't have to worry because my son's a doctor after all. He's going to look after me, right? And the same doctor didn't do much. So as I kind of realized about all of that, I said to myself, you know, man, something has to come out of this. And I started reading voraciously. And I remember one of the first books I read was um, Cobble Esselstyn's book, you know, on prevent and reverse heart disease. And although my dad didn't die of heart disease, the chapter in there just, it spoke to me. It said, moderation kills moderation kills. And, 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 you know, as I reflected on my dad's life, anyone who saw him would have said, he was pretty good. He wasn't an alcoholic. He didn't drink alcohol. He didn't smoke. He, you know, he like enjoyed some, some processed, you know, sweet foods and some chips and some variables and, and soda, but it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't excessive. But for my dad, that level of ingestion, that level of drug, for lack of better terminology, was enough to destroy him. And so for him, him being moderate was enough to kill him. And we never know that threshold. We see it in medicine. We see it in terms of, if I prescribe a pill, how much a small dose can impact someone horribly. A large dose may not impact anyone. And so we see that nearly immediately, but for food, we don't see it. And so it just, it, it spoke to me. And as I started doing more research and kind of reading and I became this kind of online uh, groupie, so to speak, of listening to lectures and reading the, the, the uh, materials in the uh, afterwards in terms of the research and the references and, and exploring. And it was just like, it's about a whole food plant-based diet. It's about an unprocessed whole food plant-based diet. That is the missing link for patients. And, and it's like, there is a role for medications in some instances, there is a role for procedures in some instances, but the missing link that bridge to keep people from going through that turnstile is a whole food plant-based diet augmented by stress reduction, by sleep, by activity, all these variables that are there. And <clears throat> you would think that that was enough to kind of just had me running outside, jumping up and down and screaming and saying, I have the answer, but I still was apprehensive because after all, I'm the jock of internal medicine subspecialties. I'm an interventional cardiologist. We make our bones, so to speak, by the complexity of procedures that we do. That is like, hey, look at what I did, you know, and getting in there. And so I was apprehensive at a certain point. I just said, you know what? I have to do this, you know? And I was a little bit, scared about what people's thoughts of me would be. And I remember going ahead and I remember, I believe it was ordained for me to have the patients who I saw in the sequence in which I saw them. I had a patient referred to me to perform a complex intervention, but they happened to be referred to me in my clinic, not directly in the cath lab. And I remember just saying, let me talk to them about this thing called nutrition and lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And I did, and they listened to me. And I remember seeing them out and they came back and they were like, I'm better, you know, I was like, how you doing? They said, doc, I'm doing better. I was like, well, really? How so? Well, I listened to you. And, and my chest pain's kind of gone away. And, and two, one patient, two patients, three patients, the same sequence happened to me over and over. And I said, you know what? I need to do something more with this. But the crazy part was that's when 
you know, Esselstyn happened to call me. <laughs> Someone had told him that I was in this, this gray zone area, but I was moving forward. And he reached out and called me. I felt it was like, a, almost like I was a groupie, as I told you, right? So I'm, I'm thinking like, who's this calling me? And then I got a call from another legend in the area of Hans Deal, and he called me. And so, and it just basically encouraged me that this is the right pathway I had to take. And so from there, I felt I need to do more. So I started that lecture series and I felt like I would do a miniature Esselstyn lecture series. And so I went and carved out my own time to deliver that to patients. And I called it the missing link because I felt that that's what it was, that missing link towards health and started this lecture series. And it was well received. And we at one point had a room filled of over a hundred people in the hospital as I'm giving this lecture. And next, they asked for, we did a survey, what do you guys want, what's next? And they all want to know cooking. So then we started, a cat, we started a cooking class. And at first it was called the doc and the dietitian after Chef AJ's, the chef and the dietitian. And then I said, no, that's not, that's not quite it. The name of this should be the cath lab. And so I, every, every session we start off the cath lab, the cath lab or cardiac catheterization laboratory is the area where cardiologists bring patients into that area, that procedural room to stop a heart attack from happening, to stem the tide of the progression of disease in that wave, acute wave, but also to help resolve symptoms. And so I call this cath lab cooking alternative to health because mm -hmm. in this realm here, we too as well are looking to go ahead and stop the heart attacks before they ever start. We're looking to go ahead and help improve symptoms and resolve those. And so, you know, it's been a wide success. Then the next level was bringing in the dietitian directly into the office. So then that way, what we're able to do is that a patient can leave from my office and go and see the dietitian immediately right then, or that they're able to come back and see the dietitian. And so that was really the genesis of things. And, and look, looking at the pathway laid out by those ahead of me who've gone before and saying, you know what, I don't have to recreate, I just need to tweak and apply it. And so not only from the, the work of Dr. Esselstyn, but also Dr. Ornish. So as a cardiologist, the low hanging fruit is, let's build a cardiac rehabilitation program, right? And let's do a cardiac rehabilitation program that's based upon a whole food plant-based diet. And that led to our accredited cardiac rehab program where my lecture is a part of it, the cooking class is a part of it. Um, we, we still apply yoga and other activities, stress reduction to as well within our, the confines of our system. And we felt like that reach wasn't great enough. So then we then moved into the realm of virtual cardiac rehabilitation, where we're still trying to apply all those principles that Ornish has shown in the intensive cardiac rehabilitation program to offset the occurrence of angina, decrease the burden of future events in order to help members who are, who are um, open to it. So that program has been a wide success, has now reached out throughout all of Southern California, and we're just trying to speak that. And this is all through Kaiser only, or does other patients have access to your program? Right now it is within solely within Kaiser, um, but the system in which we knew, we use is not proprietary just to Kaiser, so it's developed through Samsung. So many other institutions are starting to inquire through Samsung of how to structure a similar type of program, um, applying virtual concepts of virtual rehab. So, awesome. Yeah. So are there any patient stories that you can share with us as far as regeneration of health, so to speak? Um, that you can share with us? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, I mean, there's, there's, there's always a story and, and you know, there's a great quote. There's a great quote by Alexander Chase. And, and he says that uh, um, in this quote, he speaks to that, um, in op that when we look at these extraordinary circumstances, right? They cease to become uh, exceptional when they occur on a daily basis, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, it no longer is shocking. A shocking occurrence ceases to become shocking when it occurs daily. And so I see these, so I, when, when it says, when we say like, oh, is there a great patient story? It's like, yeah, okay, I have, that's nearly about every day um, when folks really engage in it. And so probably my best story that I like to kind of share is a patient, actually, there's two stories. One story, it kind of really speaks to me negatively, right? And so I was in a rush, as sometimes we as physicians, we become rushed. My schedule was overbooked. I had meetings, I had obligations to go elsewhere, and my clinic was running late because I, I committed to spending full time. And so I remember walking into this room, rushing into the room, and I saw a disheveled man who was there. He smelled of smoke. 
and he was there and and I remember talking with him and he was a bit gruff and so I remember immediately kind of mirroring his persona and and being very direct and saying well it sounds like you're going to need to have surgery it sounds like you're going to need to have open heart have the valve replaced and go down that road didn't talk about lifestyle didn't talk, didn't have any niceties kind of opening up as we went into brief discussion, as he mentioned the symptoms. And he stopped me and he said, is there anything else? Can I do anything else, doc? And I remember looking up from him from my computer and saying, yeah, there's something else you can do. And I just said, really, Kurt, you can go on a whole food plant-based diet, give up salt, oil, and sugar um, if, you, if you want to get better. And I turned back around and I, and I typed a bit more. And he said, okay he said to me okay and it stopped me in my tracks in that moment and i had this tingling sensation and this sense of just being ashamed as i then turned to him and i had what i like to feel is a normal conversation that i have with patients and this man went on to really adopt a whole food plant-based diet losing weight feeling better avoiding surgery and what that taught me is that one thing that gets in the way of patients getting better sometimes are us as physicians, not seeing their worth, not seeing the ability of an individual to change. And so it, it stressed to me the importance of every patient every time deserves the same level of care. And that care includes administering a prescription for lifestyle. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's up to them to go ahead and take. So that, that was one story, which, you know, is for me, it's powerful. It speaks to me and it says more about what I have to do in stopping myself and making sure I'm in the right frame of mind with every patient every time. And the second patient as a patient kind of came to me um, as a second opinion. And they came in kind of asking really about, hey, listen, I've been having this pain. They weren't seeking out lifestyle, but they were saying, I'm having all this pain. And my doc was saying, just adjust the medications a bit more. And I said, you know, I'm kind of concerned. The patient actually could not walk 50 feet without grasping their chest, getting short breath. I said, we need to take you in. We can talk about everything else afterwards. And he said, oh, I'm open to anything. I said, oh, I get that, but we need to go look first, right? Mm -hmm. There's high, there's, your brake lines may be severed. We need to figure out what's going on. So brought him in, took a look, horrific disease, mm -hmm. horrible disease all over the place. I brought him out of the lab. We stopped. I talked to his wife. I told him that everyone would recommend surgery. And he was groggy. He said, can I just see you in clinic? So I saw him back in clinic and I told him the traditional recommendations are for surgery given the extensiveness of disease and given his symptoms where they, they lay at that time. And he looked at me and he said, I don't wanna do surgery. I'll do whatever you tell me to do. And I'll be honest, once again, that sense of people don't think docs get nervous. And my staff, they don't necessarily think, see me being nervous all the time, but inside I'm a little kid who's nervous. Am I making the right decision? right? Because it's someone's life at hand. And so I said, okay, we'll try this, but close monitored. I said, you'll go into the rehab. You're going to go no salt, no oil, no sugar. And let's go very slow. I told the staff, we're going to go very slow with him. Didn't see him back two weeks, four weeks, six weeks. Didn't make it back. Start just staying in my mind persistently. Came back in. And the same man told me that he's like, doc, I'm doing better. I said, oh, really? I said, okay, what does that mean? What does that mean you're doing better? He said, well, doc, you know, I listened to you. I changed the game. I went ahead and I adopted it full hearted, wholeheartedly. And he said, I'm now playing golf four times a week. And <laughs> golf and 18 holes of golf. And his only complaint was that of plantar fasciitis. Once again, telling me that there is such power in this. And it's not, it doesn't mean that everyone's going to have the same outcome. It doesn't mean everyone's going to get the same level of, of benefit. But it tells because everyone has a different starting point. And, and things that happen in them. But it tells us that when we invest in our health future, the same way we invest in our financial future, chances are it's going to pay off. It's gonna pay off well. So mm -hmm. those are my stories which keep me going when I hear, when I see things like that. Well, those are very powerful, not only to a patient, but also, you know, as a physician. I, and I love how you had the opportunity to reflect in It'll motivate you because it is hard. You come into, there are going to be patients that as physicians, you're like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> they came back. <laughs> and you're like, 
I am going to be a good person today, you know, because we are humans, we yes. have biases and, you know, some patients can be a little bit very uh, challenging. Rough, challenging, difficult, and they, they push our limits, but we remain professionals yes. and it's hard, it's hard, but it is fun to see those stories. So now tell me a little bit about, so you've adopted this yourself. How about the rest of your family? The rest of my family, yes and no and sort of, right? So the one thing, <laughs> well, here's what I, I, I believe, same thing as in my practice. So what I believe separates you and I from some of the other docs who have a, who've been at this longer and folks seek them out is that we're fishing an awful lot of times. We're fishing, and so I believe my job is to cast a net and hopefully that folks will, will bite to like as far as the information and take hold of it. So with my family, I've taken the stance that I'm not going to beat my teenage kids up with this, but I plant the seeds. So my daughter, she goes back and forth, says, I'm vegan, you know, and I'm eating healthfully and I'm eating healthful foods. Then she may go off for a little bit and have a little bit of fish um, or certain things she won't have. My son will go back and forth. Just last night, he said to me, and I, I just, sometimes I just chuckle at myself, say, have they never listened to me? He said, yeah, I want to eat more fruits and vegetables. I said, oh, that's a unique idea. I said, that's great, sure. What can we do to help you? Um, so they'll, they'll do those sorts of things like that. My wife, too, as well, she recently kind of gave up cheese. Um, nice. you know, finally gave up cheese. And I think her last lingering is that she will have, she will never cook. We don't cook. There's no meat cooked. There's no cheese inside the house at all. Um, but when, if we're out, she might have fish. Mm. And that's about the limit of what she'll have. The most yeah. part. So that's that's my that's my family for the most part. But what I love is that I listening to them speak to their friends. Mm -hmm. I know that it's taking root. I know mm -hmm. that the seeds are germinating and that it's growing inside mm -hmm. of them. And they're seeing they're seeing the effect of it. And my son made mention to me. He said, "Dad, I don't want you. He's he's thirteen, five eleven, <laughs> and uh, size fourteen shoe." And he's never drank milk or any of the other stuff like that there. And he said, I don't want you to kind of lose your memory like some people when they get older or to have other issues. And I said, son, I said, neither do I. I said, that's why dad is always trying to make sure that I exercise and I'm eating as healthfully as possible and that we're feeding the good guys, not the bad guys, which is what I've told them since they were really small. Hmm. So they're there, they're on this journey. And, and my job, I believe, is for me to guide them and to treat them with and treat them as I would any patient with kind of like love and encouragement and saying, we have to move further. So hmm. now what about your, your mom or your siblings? Because they witnessed your dad as well. Did that have any impact? It, it does. It does. And it, and it has. I mean, my siblings, they've all they are kind of comparable to like my wife and my kids in which they will have a predominantly a plant predominant diet. Um, my mom who looks great is virtually about 99%. I think if she gets around her family, she might have a piece of fish or something like that mm -hmm. with her brother and sister. But other than that, she for the most part is, and is a whiz from New Orleans making a vegan gumbo, which is oh, wow. phenomenal. Um, my, uh, my sister likewise has been on, on this journey and goes back and forth and she had done exceptionally well um, for a period of time. And I think she's, she's what committed back down that road and my brother and my other sister, likewise, they've told me, but they don't want me coaching. Remember my birth order. My birth, birth order is I'm the last, the youngest. So I'm overlooked. So <laughs> it doesn't matter what I do in life. They're still big brother, big sisters. So I don't tell them what to do, but they all are, they all are, are doing very well. Oh, that's great. That's fantastic. Yeah. So then you have some other projects that you're, you're doing. Can you share with us what that is? Yeah. No, absolutely. I'd love to. You know, I think what becomes important and growing up where I've grown up as far as in the inner city and being fortunate enough to be birthed in a home where there was such an emphasis on education and an investment in the children to move out of that area there. Um, I haven't lost track of where I come from and I see a real burden in urban communities. Um, and that applies to all ethnic, eth ethnic groups, but those who perhaps are financially distraught. And what I've observed is the fact that people are, so, so to speak, enslaved to food. And I don't mean just in terms of being slaves to food or from a historical perspective. I mean that when we tell folks to make a change, but they live in a community 
where all around them, there's an absence of healthful foods. When they live in the community and they're on a fixed budget or a narrow budget, and they have government subsidized foods and fast food chains, convenience stores that are readily available for meager amounts of money, and we're telling them to make a change, and they're trying to balance light, uh, lights, rent, that's unfair. They're essentially enslaved to their environment. When we tell folks that now they're under the stressors of life from all these different things, and now they go at the end of the day, where they revert to? They revert to those comfort foods that draw them back in. And so part of what I'm trying to focus on is focusing in urban communities in delivering this message of health. Delivering the message of health framed under the construct that, that folks can identify with. And that's one of the biggest projects that I think is so vitally important because when we look at health disparities that is really kind of weighing down society and that's estimated that we could save millions, tens of millions of dollars if we were to narrow health disparities. That means that when we look at African Americans dying sicker and sooner in terms of disease burden from diabetes, from stroke, from heart disease, across the, 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 the spectrum, the American Indians, we look at South Asians, we look at um, uh, Pacific, Pacific Islanders all dying at rapid, at rapid rates, it's unnecessary and we know it boils back down to food. And so that's one of my passions right now is really developing strategies and methods to deliver this message that it doesn't have to be all or none. The Adventist Health State told us that if you begin moving from eating any and everything to a plant predominant diet, but guess what? Your diabetes improves, your heart disease improves, your blood pressure improves, your weight improves. So oftentimes it's seen as all or none Oftentimes it's seen as if you should just do it and anyone can do it and there's a lack of desire on this person. And I believe we have to look at folks with a degree of empathy, which is lacking in, in the, our world and walk in their shoes and realizing, you know, sometimes there's more complexity to it. That not only are we asking folks to sever their emotional ties, we're asking them to kind of choose sometimes financially over what to do, and they're so distraught over what to do because they hear so many different messages and the news media, and they're uncertain. And so that's what I'm really intent on doing is saying that when my, my grandmother was alive and my grandfather were, were alive from New Orleans, I remember one of their staples were what? Red beans and rice, mm -hmm. because it was cheap. Mm -hmm. It didn't cost much. It doesn't have to be expensive. And so that's one of the things I'm committed to showing them. It doesn't have to be expensive. You look society after society after society. There wasn't this plethora of meat. Mm -hmm. They weren't doing that. They were eating the basic foods of the earth, which is what we have to kind of get back to at a minimum and preferably go 100% for our future of our world, the future for our kids, the future for ourselves and our own health and well-being. Um, you know, that's one of the key things in multiple cultures, multiple people from taking care of patients just like you. One of the things that I can commonly tell patients are not fearful of death. That's not the biggest thing that, that they're fearful of, I believe. They're fearful of being a burden. They're fearful of not being able to live life that they want, which means they're fearful of that their health span will be shortened. And that's why I tell folks, my dad's health span was shortened. Yes, he lived to age 78, but his health span ended probably about age 70, really, yeah. truly about age 60 before. Before his, he, was, he was enslaved to medications, procedures, doctor visits, and everything of that sort. And that's what our goal is to keep people from. So, you know, it's exactly right. It's almost like they're, they're alive, but they're not. Mm. We're living, but we're not really living our purpose, our, our driven uh, you know, what, what we're here to do and accomplish in the world. You know, I was just talking to my own husband earlier. I was like, imagine if we had a world where everyone ate a plant-based diet and they were well, what yeah. would this world be like? Yeah. I mean, you got to wonder about the violence that would be decreased, the yeah. moods, the relationships, our earth it would yeah. be such a different place um, just by altering what we put on our plates. Um, that's very, very powerful. It is. It is. I mean, when you look at that perspective of, of how our mind is transformed by our foods and you have, you're invigorated with energy and you look at the domino effect, we look at number one, when the health goes, a person's ability to work goes. When their health goes and their ability to work, their ability to really truly be a loving, empathetic person goes. 
the ability to, to, to convey that type of, of, of nurturing environment to their offspring goes away too as well. And now you, you escalate this cascade that may be propagated through epigenetics, right? Now, as we know now, and it's just perpetuating this further decline and further widening of the gap in health disparities and these negative outcomes. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's, 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 very, it's very troubling. It's very troubling kind of what we see. Yeah, a couple of years ago when I was in Florida, I actually did um, a couple of weeks actually where I did $7 a day on a whole food plant-based diet because that's about um, two fifty dollars a month is about what someone will get um, mm -hmm. on SNAP and um, took pictures of receipts and, you know, granted it wasn't a huge variety, but I got all the, you know, types of foods in, um, yeah. you know, I ate a lot of beans and a lot mm -hmm. of potatoes and rice and things like that yeah. but you know you could show that it could be done and you were satisfied you were full you could definitely get enough calories for a grown man even yes. um so it can very well be done so what is your intent or moving forward do you have a specific vision of where you'd like to be and is there any way that maybe the audience can help you well i mean i think one of the things that i personally believe that the new venue for giving information is through media, it is. Mm -hmm. And so whether or not it's through um, short clips, whether or not it's through um, featured films, whether or not it's through television, I think that's the way in which, and through stories, delivering the message through stories um, intertwined with education becomes important. And so that's one of my, 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 the goals of one of the nonprofit organizations I'm, I'm working with is mm -hmm. their goal is to kind of deliver um, information out in in terms of the uh, media. That's what I would love to see. You know, this is no, at this point, being honest with you, there's no, this is all my side hobby. I I basically, I have, I have a day job, I have a practice, but like I started off at the beginning, I mean, I'm really truly committed to this because when I look at my father's legacy and what I was unable to deliver to him from, uh, from really from ignorance, from lack of knowing, um, I want to make sure I make up for that and kind of delivering it out there on a larger scale. And the goal is to reach people. So whether or not that reaching people is through my community talks, going to churches, going to community centers around in urban communities that are there and folks who may not be inclined to click on a particular documentary, they may not be inclined to listen to Dr. Oz, if you want to listen to him. <laughs> they may not be inclined to read anything that, that mentions um, that's a book that's aimed at healthful living and they're inclined to find Wayne quick fix that now if I can capture them in that moment and deliver a message to them that it may potentially impact change and I mean I'll tell you whenever I get a little discouraged about why am I I have so much on my plate I'm raising kids with my wife and we're doing different things you know why don't I just stay so with what I'm doing I never forget I was sitting down at this conference and someone walked up behind me and they said hey doc and i turned around and didn't know who they were from adam but sometimes you know that may happen to us right mm -hmm. <laughs> folks yes. look a little bit different and he just said doc i want to encourage you to keep doing what you're doing you're you're touching lives and you're making a difference and i just wanted to, i just wanted to come over and tell you to keep doing what you're doing mm -hmm. and i don't know if i need to hear that at that time obviously mm -hmm. i haven't forgotten it mm -hmm. and it's just like you know that's really what it's about it's not really about for monetary goals or anything of that sort it's really because my goal is to kind of give the information and see that change because that is my selfish thing is that i love folks getting better and saying without me touching them from a standpoint of a procedure without me having to prescribe pills but for them to own it and do it just from a degree of encouragement to let them know they could do it you know um so that's that's ultimately what my, my goal is so we're working on different things we're shooting little little video clips i'm giving lectures the series is entitled slave food um with this nonprofit and this other llc um that that asked me to get involved and so it's great i i i enjoy doing it because it is a situation that that we have to apply it so mm -hmm. we're hitting first African-Americans, we're hitting um, Hispanic, Latino population, we're hitting too as well, the Filipino population who has mm -hmm. a high preponderance. Their diet is horrendous. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes, absolutely it is. So that's the goal. And it's just, I want to start a grassroots 
um, effort that we can hopefully squeeze out some of these less healthful foods inside of these urban communities that have been squeezed out from a historical standpoint. Wow. That's really the goal. I mean, it's really fun to hear doctors just light up about sharing a message of prevention so mm -hmm. that we, you know, put ourselves out of business. I always tell patients, you know, put me out of business. That would be fantastic. Cause that means that I've achieved what I went into medicine to do. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think people are surprised to hear that when you, you relay that message because they just see doctors as writing prescriptions or doing procedures. And the fun thing is, you know, like you and I met, I don't know when, a couple years ago at the Plantation Project, maybe somewhere else, I don't recall. It was a bit of a while. Yeah. And, um, it's just so energizing. Like we just, you know, when we were just in California at the Plantation Project, for me, you know, and I've said this a million times, and I'm sure people get old tired of the joke, but it's like, you know, I'm going back to the mothership to recharge because yeah. it's like we're all connected in our network and we get so excited to be around other people who are sharing the same message and, and saving lives and being a part of that is such an amazing experience. Do you feel yeah. the same? Absolutely. I think that's a great, that's a great analogy. It's like getting back and getting recharged because, you know, I'm inspired. When I'm around others and it's like, you know, I could do more. I'm not doing enough. You know, this life is very short. It's like, why not? Let's push it. Let's go ahead and, and do some things. And so, you know, that's where I'm, I'm committed. I think the more people that we touch and the more there's a greater reach and folks being willing to kind of give of themselves, that's mm -hmm. what it takes ultimately. I mean, you know, you're taking your time. I take my time, mm -hmm. but I, don't, I see it as this is part of our purpose. You know, right. it's part of our purpose. And I'm very thankful I have a purpose that truly, I'll tell you exactly what it's like. Okay. I never forget when I got my white coat as a med student and I had this degree of rush that was there. It's like, oh man, I'm kind of on my way. Mm -hmm. And then I remember graduating and starting and just the nerves and feeling excited about taking care of patients. I remember being apprehensive to even examine the patient. <laughs> and you know, you become, you become not scarred, but you become jaded and you're just kind of, you're in this course of cycle of just doing the same thing over and over. And what I found is that over the past 10 years that I have kind of committed my practice towards lifestyle and a whole food plant-based diet and my personal life as well, is that I've been reinvigorated with this passion on a day in and day out basis. And what keeps me going is what new way can I use to innovate it? Because I mean, I see this whole script like a, a, a superhero's movie, right? There's a superhero for everyone. There's Superman, Batman, Green Lantern, Flash. But guess what? Every superhero movie is the same. A good guy, a bad guy, a love interest, a conflict. There's a beginning and an end. In the end, the superhero wins. We know that, unless it's a cliffhanger and a sequel, right? <laughs> And so, but then they still win. <laughs> this is right. That's right. So we know the answer is a whole food plant-based diet. That yes, we understand that. But we can package that message, that movie, in different ways that will appeal to different people and widen our reach. And that's the way I see it. And that's where my mind has gone towards is what new way can I deliver this message and what different mm -hmm. way. Right. So I, I see this as a marketing situation. Exactly. So I have an MBA. And for me, I just like, I have to be the best marketer I can be with every single patient. The commercial has to change. Yes. And so for me also is invigorating, right? So I know exactly what you're saying. And my daughter, she's in her third year of medical school. And when I see her get excited about, you know, she delivered babies, <laughs> you know, she delivered four babies in her OB rotation. It's so fun to hear those excitement. Yeah. And I'm like, but just wait to what you're going to do. You know, I just, <laughs> oh, you know, I, you know, so I'm always keeping close tabs on her, but I do know what you mean, but then you do, you kind of get in this oh, struggle and then you commit to a whole food plant-based diet and you're using it with patients and you get so excited because this story is just beginning with each patient, right? So you're helping write the intro, you're doing the forward, they're yeah. going to write this story. And it's so fun to be just kind of, the reader in their story and their journey that you help start them on. They're ultimately writing it. Yeah. And then that ends, right? This happy ending of, guess what? My favorite thing to do is take someone's diabetes off their chart or hypertension. Like you're not a diabetic anymore. You're not hypertensive anymore. Those are the beautiful endings that we really want. It's, it's like writing a new book and a new 
watching a movie every single patient, every, every single time, and you go through your list of patients and you're like, I'm going to tell you and you, and you. so yes. it, it's, it is, it's a lot of fun. And it's, um, you know, I've, and I've quoted this before is like, I call it veggie crack. So I tell people <laughs> eat vegetables, it's, they get me excited and it's, it's like a dopamine. Like, come on, you got to eat your vegetables so I can get my high for the day. That's right. That's right. I really need that. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, I, I, I totally understand. And it's a, a beautiful thing that you're doing. And, um, you know, it, people like you have to be highly commended for taking the effort and the time because you are, you're raising kids. It's hard. You're, you're working as a busy cardiologist. I don't know if your wife works, but that makes it even harder. And, um, you know, I just hope people understand the value of the sacrifice that you're taking personally to share the message with a community that really needs it. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I mean, I do, I do believe once again, is the fact that people are going to do what's important to them mm. and what you're committed. And lot, time goes by, either you do something or don't, time is still going, going to go by. And so I find that I have actually more time. And I think it's a good opportunity for my kids to see me active in the community, to see me active and giving back that where it's not for pay. I remember one time when they were smaller, they said, hey, why aren't you going and giving this lecture? Don't you get more money if they don't listen to you? <laughs> <laughs> It, exactly i said but sometimes it's not about money it's about doing the right thing so it's like that's a good life lesson for them you know and so it's all important it's all intermingled in kind of what we do you know it really, right. it really truly is it really truly is i mean i had the great opportunity we'll see this story is about to be written and right at the beginning forward but i met with someone to really look about changing the in one of the hospitals i, I work at the food that's delivered and so it was the executive um, chef and so forth. And we're sitting and it looked like a healthy guy. And so we're talking. And so something just said, oh, you know, you don't have any chronic disease, right? And he said, yeah, I do. I was like, you do? What? And so he said, I have diabetes. I was like, oh, you just got diagnosed? He said, no, I've been diabetic for 20 some odd years. And I'm looking at him. And I said, so you're type one? No, I just got on insulin. And he said, I said, well, what's your values? And he told me his, his, his A1C values, which were horrible. And so I said, okay, stop. I said, it's not about, right now we're not gonna talk about the hospital or about the structure or about the system. I said, it needs to be about you. I said, mm -hmm. we need to stop and we need to talk about you. I said, you know, I know I'm being a little bit forward and everything like that. I said, but, and this is completely up to you. I said, I'm gonna write down some stuff I want you to check out first. I said, come back over and let's meet. If you're willing to, no pressure. If you don't reach back out to me, I won't say anything about this, this discussion again. And we can go back to, to discussing everything else. And so he was like, okay, I appreciate it. One day went by, no response. Two days, three days later afterwards, he sends me an email and says, I appreciate you. Thanks. Let's, let's, let's meet. I'll meet whenever you want. Oh. So that story is yet to be written. But I mean, that's what it's about. It's potentially mm -hmm. just giving people the information for them to make a decision. You think about how powerful will that be for him to have a transformative change and his desire to implement that throughout all of the hospitals that he services. It's not about just solely that story. It's his story, his story, mm -hmm. which will be important for serving as a platform and a springboard to change. That's the same for all of us. And when it, and hopefully fingers crossed and prayers yes. will be said for him that when he reverses his diabetes or at least makes it significantly better, what a driving force for him to continue when he hits obstacles, implementing better food choices in a system that might be not as warm to it in some places. It's, it's everything's a struggle. <laughs> Nothing just happens like a whole overdog. You know, it's like you see these, these really successful people at their career and you're like, oh, they're just an overnight success. You know, we don't see the 10 years of lessons and struggles and sleeping on couches. <laughs> exactly. so we just see the, the end result. But I, you know, I, it's really fun to see those ripple effects. You know, one person touches one person and touches another person. Yeah. It's so it's great, powerful. It's great stuff. It's great yeah. stuff. It definitely keeps us going. So. Absolutely. So I do have one question. And um, so I get a lot of questions on statins and you're a cardiologist. And of course, I'm 
very good friends with Kim Williams and I've talked to, you know, lots of other cardiologists, Joel Kahn and stuff about this. I'd like to get your take on it because, you know, people are asking, what about those statins? Those aren't good medicines. Like, oh, you know, they actually have proven benefit. So, but as from a cardiologist, when do you decide to implement medications when outside of, you know, with lifestyle, but when do you feel like medications are also required? So for me, what I end up doing, that's a great question. So you have to understand that in part two, as a cardiologist, I'm seeing a skewed segment of the, of the patients, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm not seeing those who are healthy with one or two risk factors or who have no risk factors. I'm typically seeing people who've had any event, an event. And for the audience out there, we characterize those who've never had an event as primary prevention. We're trying to prevent them from having their first event. If they've had one event, we're trying to prevent them from having a second event. That's called secondary prevention. So once they've had one event, it's almost the recommendations and the, the body of evidence kind of does support giving a statin for sure in those individuals. For patients, now here's the, the dilemma, and this is what I commonly will tell patients, is the fact that now we don't have any double-blinded randomized trials or even observational that are looking at a cohort of individuals who've gone whole food plant-based, who are exercising, gaining their water, gaining their rest, and their cholesterol levels are rock bottom low and seeing that they have an added benefit of statin therapy in that particular situation. So I tell them, I don't know. Mm -hmm. If there's going to be clear benefit, I can only extrapolate data based off of the research that's available. So from there, then we decide, oftentimes what I'll do for those who are truly committed is that I'll say, okay, you know what? We'll do a seesaw. We'll start with the statin. Let's have you go with the diet and we'll reassess your cholesterol. Reassess your cholesterol off of the statin. If the cholesterol values are rock bottom or low, not tremendously rock bottom low, but are low off the statin, I may check a few other markers, inflammatory markers, just to kind of add to it. I may check a C-reactive protein. I may check a small dense LDL. I may check an LP little A and see if those are still persistently elevated. If they're still persistently elevated, despite them applying all the techniques of lifestyle, we'll have a more intense discussion over the pros and cons of continuing the satin therapy. Mm -hmm. If those levels, if they are high, despite the therapy, then we have a real discussion. It's like, you're doing everything maximal, the levels are still up. It's not a scarlet letter because you have to use pharmaceuticals in addition to lifestyle. Mm -hmm. It's about doing what's best for you and being specific to you as an individual. So we should never be mutually exclusive, but we should be thoughtful and should not be just robotic in the approach that everyone gets the same script. Mm. I think that's very, very helpful for people just to understand they are individuals. Mm. Everybody should be eating a whole food plant-based diet. We are humans, yes. the species, homo sapiens. <laughs> okay. <laughs> people tell me, oh, but I needed this and I needed that, you know, because I need animal parts. Like, no, no, you don't. No. Yeah. No, no, your 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 middle parts are just the same as mine. And, you know, it's like, exactly. But those medications, absolutely, and that's what I like to marry. You know, you have your nutrition, which will supplement it with um, medicine when necessary, and that's okay because it's not a panacea. It's an amazing tool, nutrition, but it's not a panacea. Absolutely, so, absolutely. Awesome. I just I just saw a young lady. Um, who tells me, and that's one of the other difficulties, right? So one of the challenges from a clinician standpoint is, I know if someone has not taken their meds based off of their lack of refilling the prescription. <laughs> so I have a direct cause and effect. I may not know if someone is really truly eating healthfully as what they tell me. Mm -hmm. So now I leave them at some degree of risk or they place themselves obviously at some degree of risk, which physicians then may be concerned from a medical legal standpoint, right? right. About am I following standard care, standard of right. care at that moment. And so I met a lady where she told me she was doing everything right. No salt, no oil, no sugar. She described her diet and I said, I have nothing to add to that. <laughs> it's, it's phenomenal. Yeah. And yet her levels were still quite, out, quite high. Mm -hmm. and, and so she came to me to ask what should she do? And so at that point, I'm having this, this very detailed conversation as I'm having, describing to her here. And I said, we're left right now with you doing everything, but still having an elevated level. Mm -hmm. I said, for that, it would seem as if you would benefit from using um, therapies in addition to it, unless you've had an adverse effect, which I describe that to folks. It's just like, you know what? I can buy a size two pair of jeans 
and three different makers and they are not going to fit the person the same way. And right. so same with your medications, you know, you're going to try until you find the one that fits for you. It doesn't mean that I'm never wearing jeans. It just means I need to find the right pair for, right. for me. Find the right yeah. brand. Yeah, exactly. So that's, uh, that's my recommendations to folks is just tailor it. So, and then what blood work do you recommend patients who may have a history of heart disease or are concerned about heart disease? What, what markers should they be asking for? Well, I mean, I think it's all the light, all, it's all the, the, the risk factors. So, I mean, we're looking at cholesterol, right? And I think it's easy to start with just your, your generic panel. It's probably fine from even if I'm looking at being cost efficient, we do this in every other venue of life, but we get mm-hmm. a little concerned when it comes to screening for medical tests. But the honest truth is if I check your cholesterol panel and your total cholesterol is 300, I don't need LP little A and small dense LDL and, and all these other variables that are there. I have the information I need um, in that moment. I need to know what your A1C or what your fasting glucose is. I need to know what your blood pressure is doing too as well. Those are some of the key, the key things. I also want to know what your sleep is like. Right, so whether or not you have a tool, a wearable that can help give you guidance or your rough estimate, I need to know what your activity is like, not what you did 20 years ago or six months ago or that you think you could do, but what you're actively doing on a day in and day out basis. Mm-hmm. Those build a picture for me mm-hmm. about where, uh, where, you're, where you're at. Um, so those are the things I typically recommend to start out. So diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, smoking, um, sleep apnea and sleeping, sleep hygiene in general exercise too as well are the keys. Fantastic. So that's an amazing. So what, um, one final, well, two final questions if you're okay, because I know I've kept you. Um, what is your favorite plant-based food? Yeah. Oh, no. Go ahead. And then I'll finish the, and I'll finish the last question when we're done. You know what? I'm pretty simple. I love a variation of, of a good kind of, uh, 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 jackfruit salad. (laughs) <laughs> is what I re- really like. And it's almost like my version of a, of, a, of a spicy taco salad is what I'll end up having with lots of black beans and variables that are there, um, different mixture of greens in there. Um, usually I'll have a dollop of, of hummus, um, preferably oil-free on it that gives me a little bit of creaminess, pico de gallo and salsa. I love spice. So that's usually like probably my routine go-to is something along the lines of that. Awesome. It is very similar to what I enjoy as well. So now for the last question, what bit of advice would you have someone who's maybe teetering and they're like listening to this? They're like, you know, they were intrigued by the idea of a cardiologist speaking about heart health. What would you recommend for someone who's like, okay, I piqued my interest, but I don't know. Yeah. You know, I think that one of the things I would recommend is find out realizing first what kind of person are you are you a jump in the pool first just jump head first or you kind of let me dip my toe in and so i think tiny habits play a role that are huge and maybe focusing and saying okay let me try out one meal and let me see figure out breakfast what i can do that's that's healthful healthful eating right not vegan but healthful eating um for breakfast or and then move on to lunch and move on to dinner for another patient i may tell them let me just have you start by adding a salad to every single meal. Once you add a salad, okay, let's replace the juice with sparkling water or the soda with sparkling water. And we begin this process of slowly integrating um, is really the the scenario. But I ultimately recommend getting in with the online coaching like your organization, I think is huge because I think everything has to be tailored. Those Mm -hmm. things, when you get the one large script and I've subscribed, I have Beachbody on demand. I've ordered all these things throughout the past 20 years and I get, I've seen the meal plans and it's like, oh, this looks great. And then you're like, I don't know what to eat. There's so much <laughs> stuff. There's information overload. You go on Pinterest, you see all this stuff. So having someone help guide you according to your likes, according to your time that you have in order to kind of spend, as well as here's the key. Like one of the things I tell folks, they're always in a dilemma over organic versus not or buying fresh. I said, buy it frozen. Buy your vegetables frozen. They don't go bad. Buy your fruit. Buy these things that are there. That that way, what you're able to do is you can serve your finances and you're able to go ahead and cook and have a healthful meal um, quickly. So that's Mm -hmm. generally what I recommend is kind of connecting with someone that they're able to kind of coach them up for the first two weeks, three weeks, 
it takes 66 days to make an official change. We love 21 days, so we say 21, but in whatever particular venue, do it for two, three weeks, and then maybe kind of begin to branch out on your own and you test mm -hmm. and plan, plan, plan. Mm -hmm. Identify what you're going to eat um, at the restaurants because we're social beings. And so you're not surprised when you get mm -hmm. there. Yeah, that. absolutely. You know, the, one of the most powerful tools you can use is this thing called the internet. I don't know if you've heard about it. <laughs> but, you know, most of these places have menus online. So it's, again, fabulous advice from the Dr. Columbus. But yes. So um, we appreciate your time, and I can't wait to see where you scar. I still think you should be on a TV show. Oh, you're too kind. No, I'm, no. everyone tells me that. All, my, all of our friends say the same thing. We need a TV show yeah, with Dr. Definitely. Columbus on it, and they're all going to be, like, wooing. So, yeah. <laughs> Oh, you guys are too kind. I need to come on the all the time, then. You're, you're in California already, so you just, you know. <laughs> drive, drive, drive down the uh, highway about 60 miles. I'll be good. All right? Yeah, it's, it's only a matter of time. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Coleman, thank you so much for your time. And, and uh, we so appreciate your spending your time and sharing your wisdom with us. Absolutely. I appreciate everything you're doing. Keep up the great work. I will. Thank you. All right.